Well, my first memories of President Bollinger were a bit strange. He was flown into New York around the time of 9-11. There was no transportation, so I rode my bicycle down, and I had a call, and are we still doing these interviews, given what's going on? I said, yes, he's in the city. Well, look, we had seen a lot of very, very impressive candidates. But I was particularly impressed by his experience, by his demeanor, by the way he carried himself. He was president of a big university, had to deal with state government, athletics at the highest level, and particularly, and most importantly to me, was that he had his name on two affirmative action suits. And um, that was the first time that I met uh, President Bollinger of the University of Michigan, soon to be President Bollinger of Columbia University in the city of New York. First, you can make yourself smarter if you work at it. You can get better, indeed much better, at thinking. But you must not accept where you are as a given, and you must study yourself and practice doing better. As an attorney, as a law professor, as the president of a university, he could really focus on those areas where he is most comfortable and where he has the most expertise. But he's fascinated by science. He's fascinated by what's happening with cancer research, what's happening with brain research. We talked about what the future of biology looked like, and that insight extended to the identification of leaders in biology, young leaders that he might consider attempting to bring to Columbia. This meeting was a job interview. He wanted to hear about, you know, what my sense was for what the law school had done well and what the law school sort of needed to rethink. So it came through in the interview that he was an innovator and that he was looking for innovators. I was in a meeting with him in last year uh, and we were talking about social media and free speech, you know, ahead of the book. And he'd mentioned several ideas that he held and then decided they weren't quite right and his position on them had been evolving. The higher you go in life, the easier it is to convince yourself that you have all the answers. It requires two complementary traits to really continue to learn and grow, and that is humility and curiosity. He's interested enough to bring people to Columbia to speak to subjects that other people haven't yet coalesced around. And so that's wonderful because he initiates things that other, others do not. He also identifies really good people and tries to bring them to the university and often succeeds. Most recent is, is Secretary uh, Hillary Clinton, uh, who is going to be a presence on the campus and for our students and, you know, for leadership in international affairs. Based on my own experience, he's persistent. <laughs> he certainly was in terms of his uh, academic work around the First Amendment, uh, his university leadership. I'm looking forward to uh, the work we're doing here at SEPA to create an institute of global politics to come up with ideas about how to protect democracy in uh, the 21st century, how to deal with the opportunities and threats caused by artificial intelligence. You know, these are really all part of the, uh, the mission that uh, I think Lee has given the university for the future. I really encourage you to think big, even unrealistically big. Set big goals for yourself, both for knowledge and for doing things. He appreciated that universities need to transform themselves. They really need to think beyond the traditional roles. And the traditional roles or the traditional mission of universities is focused on education, it's focused on research, it's focused on service. But what President Bollinger articulated very clearly is the need for a fourth purpose. What the fourth purpose represents is taking that work of the university and partnering with civil society you know, the advancement of humanity, nothing short of the advancement of humanity 
Lee's whole life is about engagement. It is about a free press. It is about an exchange of ideas. It is not about hearing voices only within the confines of traditional university campuses. Lee Bollinger always thinks big. One of the first ideas of Lee's that was presented to me was a three-page memo that described the idea of the Knight First Amendment Institute. Somehow, over just a little more than 10 years, today we have 10 global centers all over the world. And each and every one of them is doing exactly what he wanted it to do. He established the idea that we will have a climate school, and that's the first climate school in the world. Uh, Lee Bollinger saw that from the start. He's building the efforts, and uh, I think we're set to go. He invited uh, Eric Kandel, Tom Jessel, and me to a breakfast at the president's house. And put simply, he said that he would like to construct on a new campus a flagship institute to address in a very broad but deep way neuroscience. Undeniably, Lee's ability to think big is most notable in the fact that he doubled the size of the campus and had the first physical expansion of any material size in a hundred years. The defining piece of President Bollinger's legacy is the establishment of the Manhattanville campus. Manhattanville is absolutely the unrealistic, you can't possibly do that proposition. When I first joined the board, the early conversations were about the Euler process, the process to get New York State to approve these plans. It just seemed impossible. Meeting after meeting, week after week, I knew then that I needed someone that I could talk with. And I was so glad it was Lee Bollinger. I could touch in some way, it's one of the ways to make a portrait of somebody. I've been lucky in my life. I've been uh, working with good clients, but Lee has a special place. In planning Manhattanville, there could have been just kind of uninspired buildings. But Lee really leaned into the idea of having art and having the best architects and having design that was inspirational. Campus used to be closed with gates. But this one in Manhattanville, West Island, it's open. It's open to the community. It's open to life. And, uh, and, and this is a big revolution. The new addition is a complete change and a complete way of thinking about engaging in, in the community. Uh, and with the help of students needling and pushing, the mindset begins to change. It's not gated, it becomes open. Walk through here and take some knowledge with you and come around the other way and drop some knowledge off. Please do not think that smartness is everything in life. Being a good person, as simple and as complicated as that little statement is, is certainly equally high on our list of human qualities. There is so much about Lee's career here that people don't see, that I've had the privilege of seeing from my seat on the board and as chair. Whether it's in the height of COVID, suiting up and going uptown to the Irving Medical Center and meeting with the staff, the president's fun run. Running is incredibly important to Lee and he wants to engage the students in that way. I think Lee has elevated the arts on this campus in the School for the Arts in a way most other schools don't. And it's because of Gene's influence, and it's because it is the arts that reflect an empathy, that make us look at the world a different way. I can't think about, about Lee without thinking about Gene. <laughs> and they, 
It's a fantastic couple. He and his wife are just two wonderful people. Gene Bollinger, of, of course, is his, you know, his soulmate. I think that Lee relies upon Jean's eye, her creative eye, clearly, in a very quiet way. I'm sure she has influenced the leadership of the School of the Arts. I'm sure that Jean has had something to do with his consideration of the beauty of the new buildings, of the architecture of the new buildings. We were doing a survey in Rwanda and we traveled uh, very far into the countryside and had the opportunity to have them join us as our teams uh, went into people's homes and asked them questions about their lives. And uh, again, I was struck by just how gracious they both were, how they listened to the people, how they respected the people, being brilliant, being visionary, uh, accomplishing so much is important, but I think for me, from a personal perspective, I think being human, being gentle, being kind, being humble is something that I personally value so much. I urge you to enjoy this period of life you are entering because, in all likelihood, it will never be like this again. This unconditional embrace of the life of the mind we nurture here is unique. Nowhere else in the world will you encounter this way of being, certainly to this degree. I think Lee loves running a global university, but I think Lee's heart is in nurturing students. When he speaks about teaching students, there is a warmth that comes over him, and I think he loves creating those intellectually welcoming spaces for young people, and I know he'll continue to do that. I just find his whole approach to life and his approach to leadership uh, to be uh, really uh, indicative of that sense of a well-rounded liberal arts education, uh, a well-rounded life uh, that I think uh, we need to be reminded of. Uh, it's easy to forget that in, in uh, the times we're living in now. President Bollinger is a unique individual. He's also a fine human being. On a personal level, I think it's, um, it's been really um, one of the highlights of my, my career and my life to have known someone like President Bollinger. I truly consider him uh, a mentor, I truly consider him a, a visionary person. I truly consider him a, a friend. It was like playing ping pong, you know. It was always like playing ping pong with uh, Lee. I think this is the essence of friendship. There's a clear correlation between his vision for Columbia University as a leader and, you know, the path that we've embarked upon. Let's see if there's new ways of approaching uh, the work of the university. Let's try to make the fourth purpose of ensuring that the university is integrated into the world and vice versa, you know, really come alive here at Columbia. Precision medicine is the future of medical practice and it's gonna be done at Columbia better than anywhere else in the world. I think a lot of people would define Lee's legacy by some thing, project, whether it's Zuckerman mind brain behavior, whether it's Manhattanville in totality, the Vagilis College of Physicians and Surgeons and all the strides that have made there. I actually take a different approach. I define Lee's legacy as the pride that he has instilled in Columbia that all those things add up to the fact that the people at this institution believe anything is possible and that this institution can play a major role in making that happen.